I should also have introduced you as the world's biggest Arsenal fan. Let's, let's talk about um, bearded veteran Thierry Henry and that amazing goal. Watch, watch them all walk away. Oh, can we have some One, mic, two, please, from my guest? Is that working? Yes, okay. Uh, yes, I mean, yeah, sorry, football for a bit. My, my certainly Twitter fans will know that I share my, uh, my Twitter feeds with motorsport, football, or Arsenal, sorry, not, not football, Arsenal and golf. And some of them get quite annoyed at times because they all want to hear about his motorsport. But uh, no, the return of our legend Thierry Henry scoring the winner uh, at Leeds was, well, at Arsenal was incredible. So yeah. where, Where'd he been? He went to Barcelona, didn't he? And then America. And he went to some other teams, weird, but yeah. he's now he's back Amazing. where he belongs, yeah. yeah. That, that's more than enough football. Okay, good. Okay, well done. <laughs> um, Mercedes-Benz DTM, by your own admission, a... a, a rubbish year last year for you <laughs> yes yeah. yeah i mean I, I, yeah it was a rubbish year so we had uh we had a few races where we had well a few races where we had serious technical problems which would just put us out of contention we probably lost i would say three podium finishes out of uh, a technical problem of one sort and then at other races we had um just not good enough performance basically so it was a struggle you know the, the previous years it's been um not easy but uh, i've been able to get in the car drive it quick and and be successful and you know in in 09 and 10 i finished second in the championship both years um this year i didn't score one podium so uh, sorry last year i didn't score one podium so it was a struggle and and for all of us it's quite difficult to understand why really there's no clear reason um so we're kind of keen to sort of move on, but um, sort of analyse everything from the year to see why and, and try to make sure it doesn't happen this year. Is it difficult to, to not let your head drop? And you're, I mean, you, you are trying your absolute best and you are, you're a shade off here, there and everywhere, but it's not happening. It must be disheartening. I, I think that's the one thing with, with DTM as it is. You know, if you are one tenth, one and a half tenths off, you'll be four, five, six positions down on the grid. So it's not like F1 where you've got a bit of a barrier. You're in a good car, you've got a three, four, five tenths barrier. You'll only be P5 or P6. You know, you can very easily be P12, P14 on the grid. And, and that's the difficulty, really. So it's, um, it is a bit disheartening. But, you know, during the year, we had good points in between. So it wasn't rubbish the whole time. You know, we had very good speed, but we just didn't have speed at the right times. I think in the races, I was um, the fastest Mercedes car in all the races, basically, over the year. So we had good race pace, but it was just qualifying. We had struggled at, you know, qualifying at the front. And with a, with a field that is separated by between five and eight tenths of a second on lap time, you start tenth in a race, you're going to finish about tenth, you know, ninth maybe, yeah. but it's, it's very difficult to go forwards. The series switched to Hankook tyres at the beginning of last year. You tested those tyres, I remember, at the beginning of the year and quite liked them. So the season yeah. boded well, didn't it? Sorry, th this negativity will stop in a minute. We, we will move on. But it's, just, it's strange, isn't it? You, you were happy at the beginning of the year and then, and then it didn't work. Yeah, I mean, I, I was the first person to try the Hankook tyres. I was very much involved in developing the tyres and choosing the tyre that we raced on and I was very happy with it. And there was no signs um, at the start of testing that they were going to cause a problem for me. But um, that was the only thing that changed. So possibly it did, I don't know. But um, yeah, it, it's, again, it's quite difficult to understand exactly what went wrong, really. Let's move on. Um, there is the new machine, uh, looking utterly sensational. Yeah, it's, sorry, it's, it's the C-Class Coupe this year, That's rather right. than the C-Class. Sorry, sorry. Right. See, that proves that you were listening backstage. Yes, Good does, man. Yes. The C-Class Coupe. Um, it's a sexy bit of kit. Um, have you had a go in it yet? Yeah, yeah. I've done quite a lot of testing with it already, and, and I think it is. The, the DTM cars from the past looked incredible, but this looks, in, you know, another level. I mean... The, the, the back to, you know, going back to a coupe makes it look more sporty. Uh, the bigger tyres make the wheel arches wider, so the car is wider than before. Uh, the height of the car is lower, so the car is lower, wider, it looks meaner. The tyres look uh, a bit meaner as well. So the cars just look incredible, and, and they sound just as a DTM car has done, which is just amazing. So you know, anybody who sees and, and hears these cars on a race circuit is, is just blown away. So those are the physical differences, yep. wider, wider track, uh, uh, it's lower in height. Anything sort of different underneath or in the power plant? Um, yes, so, so um, the engine is the same. So we still have a 4-litre V8, which is the same as we've had in the past. Um, the gearbox is different now. So we have a paddle shift gearbox now, which we didn't have in the past, which is a standard Hewland gearbox for all teams. Um, the biggest change for this year is the chassis. So we used to make our own space frame chassis. 
this year we have a carbon monocoque, which is standard, made by one company, standard for all teams. So everybody has the same chassis to start from. So there's a very uh, large sort of base for people to build their car around, basically. The front and rear floors, the front splitter and the rear floor, are again our standard, so they are spec parts, so you just make the parts to a specification, basically. So the, the significant thing is that a lot of standard components on this car, which hopefully will make the racing very close from the word go, which I think was especially important with BMW coming in to make sure they could at least compete from a very early stage. Yeah, well, I was gonna move on to BMW. They are coming back to DTM after a huge amount of success in the kind of late 80s and early 90s great for the championship to have another mega uh, manufacturer in absolutely you know the series is is very good now it's gone to a to a different level so having the three biggest german manufacturers now racing in the same series is incredible i mean for us it's really exciting to have another manufacturer um i was getting quite excited about having a lot of new drivers in but as it happens two of our fellow drivers are now there so there's not so many new drivers but it's going to be interesting to see certainly how Andy Prio and Augusto Farfus get on. You know, they've been racing in world touring cars for a long time. So it'd be interesting to see how they adapt uh, to the cars. They've got two incredibly tough teammates in Bruno Spengler from Mercedes and Martin Tomczyk. So it's going to be difficult for them. But um, they've certainly got a very strong team of drivers. And uh, certainly they'll be looking to start uh, very strongly. Do you think these new regulations were created around BMW? and its desire to come in on a level playing field and be competitive? No, no, I don't think so. I think it makes them, uh, make, makes them happy. You know, it, it makes it easier for them to come in. But I think it was, built, it was built for the series to become stronger. Because when you have two manufacturers, OK, they're two big manufacturers. But if one pulls out, you know, in, 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 we had a moment in, I think it was 2007, where Audi pulled all their cars out of a race because they were unhappy about some decisions. So suddenly, you've got a one-make formula, which nobody wants to watch. So to make the series stronger, we have to get more manufacturers in. And it wasn't just done for BMW. We want to get more than BMW in. We want more manufacturers coming in in the future. And that is the goal. So we need to make it possible for anybody who's looking to come into the series, look, you can start with this car, and it won't take too much to get up to speed. Yeah, yeah that was Barcelona, wasn't it? When they yes. went out and yeah. yeah, embarrassing Yeah, for everybody. Yeah. Um, testing ahead of the start of the season, how much are you going to get to do? Uh, and, how, and how much, with this sort of standard chassis, how much setup is there? Yeah, there's, there's a lot. So um, we have a lot of standard components, but uh, there's a lot of aerodynamic parts, um, which is quite hidden, really. So around the wheel arches, down the side of the car, which uh, you're pretty free to do. The rear wing, again, is a standard part. Um, but all of your suspension is free. So you've got the pickup points on the gearbox, but there's quite a range of pickup points. So all of your suspension and uprights, things like that, is, is free for you to play with. So there's still an incredible amount of work that you can do to try and get uh, more out of the car, yeah. And you're part of the sort of crack uh, AMG uh, squad again. How many different teams are going to be running cars for Mercedes this year? Uh, I think it'll be three, as it has done in the past. I think there's still unsure of how many cars each manufacturer is running. BMW are going to run six. Mercedes and Audi are looking to run maybe seven, maybe eight. I'm not sure. But I think both Mercedes and Audi will still run three teams running cars. So we'll still have HWA, which is the works team that I race with, and uh, Person Motorsport and Mooka Motorsport as well. OK, and we've got the likes of David Coulthard uh, uh, sticking in the DTM. It's a uh, it gives good profile to the series, doesn't it, when, when guys like that want to come and play. And we had Mika Hakkinen, we had Jean Lacey. Yes, yes, and certainly Ralph Schumacher, who has been in there for a couple of years now, had a bit more of a successful day this year. I mean, none of them have been able to sustain a real championship challenge, but they've had good results, they've had race wins. And, uh, yeah, it just increases the profile of the championship. I think that's one thing about the DTM with each manufacturer having so many cars. They can have a range of drivers in the cars. They can have the, the guys fighting for the championship. They can introduce younger guys into the series to try and bring them on. They can bring in people like David, like Ralph, to, to draw the punters. And, and they, they, you know, they, they really want to race still. You know, they're not retired and they're not, like, you know, retired and don't want to try. They are really trying very hard. And it's, uh, it, it gives you a great mix of motorsport, yeah. I think people don't appreciate that underneath what looks ostensibly like a C-Class Coupe, these are unbelievably sophisticated bits of kit. They're, they're, they're like Grand Prix cars with bodies, aren't they, really? 
Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, you've got your, your, your wishbone suspension, which is the same as a Formula One car has. You have, you know, your crumple zones front and rear. But the most of it is just carbon bodywork on top of a, on top of a chassis. So there's very little actually inside. It's just space, basically, which is covered by carbon. So they are very much referred to as, as an F1 car with a carbon fiber lightweight body on top. And they can, you know, they provide an incredible amount of downforce. You know, the front splitter and especially the rear diffuser is, is really big. And, and the, the amount of downforce they have uh, for, for a touring car is incredible. It's always interesting at the end of the year when the McLaren Autosport BRDC uh, young guys do their evaluation in one of these. They are all, to a man, blown away by the DTM car, aren't they? They, they can't yeah. quite believe the, the, the level of grip generated by what's quite a heavy car yeah, I mean, uh, compared with a single-seater. Yeah, the, the, car, the cars weigh just over 1,000 kilos, so they're pretty heavy. Uh, but they have around about 500 brake horsepower and, uh, yeah, as they produce a lot of downforce. So they are definitely, they're very good fun to drive. Uh, they're very tough to get the last little bit out. I mean, they're quite easy to get to somewhere near the pace, but then quite difficult to get right to the very top. Um, but, you know, they are extremely fun to drive and anybody who yeah, drives one has, has a really good time, yeah. Quick word about Formula One and your testing role with McLaren. That's exciting, isn't it? Making Lewis and Jensen's cars go quicker. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's stuff that I do that's very much behind, behind the scenes, really. So I kind of uh, sit in the, in the dark simulator for days on end, uh, driving around various different circuits, um, trying to make our, our, our McLaren Mercedes go as fast as possible, really. You know, it's, uh, it's an incredible world, the simulation world, because it's, it, you're free to do whatever you want, basically. So these engineers come up with all these crazy ideas. We try them, some work, some don't work, and then we have various different things of improving the car setup, uh, trying different setups for all the different circuits. Uh, one of the most, more, the newest things that we've been doing, which is pretty incredible, I think we're the only team able to do it, is that we, um, we, we are, always have a driver in the simulator on the Friday of a race weekend. And we basically shadow what they're doing at the circuit. And we change setups in the simulator on the Friday that then they just fit to the race cars and race at the weekend. It's difficult to compute, isn't it, that to, to somebody who doesn't understand how simulators work that you're effectively in a very, very, very flashy, expensive computer game. Yes, uh, and exactly. What's, yeah. And what's going on can actually be translated to a real car in real time on a real racetrack. It, weird. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it's the correlation that you have to have, and we work very hard on that. So Lewis and Jensen and, and all the race drivers we've had come back from the race weekends. You know, they go in the simulator the week after, drive the same circuit and say, right, this is the same, this is different, how do we change it? Because it's really important, because the test drivers don't get to drive the race car at all, or not very often, we need to know that the car we're driving in the simulator is exactly the same as they, they have on track. What can you tell me about MP427 then? Uh, probably absolutely nothing. No, not really. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, we, the regulations haven't changed that much from, from last year. So we have the new exhaust concept. So we've, we've got rid of the blown, the blown floors. So we still have the exhausts uh, doing something, obviously. But they are a very different position to where they were before. So there's a very different effect on your downforce, especially on throttle compared to last year. So your balance of your car on, on entries and exits of the corners is quite different to what we've had before. So we've had to do a lot of work to adjust for that. But, um, you know, it's very, so difficult to say. We're always quite confident or that our car is good. We've done a lot of work. The progress seems to be going very well. And um, until we get testing, we won't know where we are. It's difficult, isn't it? And I, I suppose in recent seasons, McLaren's been guilty of starting slowly and then winning the development race and catching up too late. Yes, yes. I mean, I think we, we certainly have the the... the, the the best ability to catch up and improve our car. You know, we, we've started the three, two out of the last three years, 09 and 11. We've had a terrible car at the first test, you know, really terrible and really been struggling, been seconds off the pace. And yet in that year, we've won races. We've fought for the championship last year. So we have an incredible ability to react to, to bad situations and improve our car during the year. But yes, we need to start the year with a better car and then we can get in front. You know, we, we are... The last couple of years, we have been kind of on the back foot catching up, and we really need to start ahead of everybody else. Okay. Good to talk to you, mate. Have a great season. Thank and you. I want you to come back uh, in 12 months' time with another DTM title, all right? Excellent. No Thank excuses. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, right. Gary Puffett. Thank you.